there's a way to make an entrance. My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. At a bank outside Los Angeles, a nighttime explosion that no one hears. Cunning criminals no one sees. It's the perfect burglary in which cash and bandits vanish without a trace. With little to go on, the FBI must use instinct and determination to solve a case that seems impossible to crack. a brazen yet simple crime. A mask, a gun, a note passed to a teller. But bank burglary is different. It takes skill to disable an alarm, to penetrate a locked vault. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In 1972, the largest bank burglary in U.S. history went down without a hitch. Eight million dollars, gone. Now agents must track a gang of sophisticated criminals. With enough money, to disappear forever. Laguna Niguel, California. March 27th, 1972. It's Monday morning at the United California Bank. Employees prepare to open for business. When the bank manager tries to unlock the vault door, it won't open. Somebody call the safe company. A technician from the vault manufacturer arrives 20 minutes later to check the door's locking system. He works for hours. The combination is right, the tumblers are in place, but unexplainably, even the expert can't get it open. It's not working. Looking for another way in, the technician climbs into the rafters above the vault. He is stunned to find a hole cut in the roof. Below, a second gaping hole leading to the vault. Agents from the FBI Santa Ana Resident Agency immediately respond to the bank. The first investigator to survey the cluttered crime scene is Special Agent Jim Conway. Upon arriving and getting up on the vault and looking down at this hole, we could see a pile of rubble, uh, I would say six feet tall and expanding out. Once inside the vault, the technician discovers a screwdriver jammed into the lock's gears. Agents suspect the thieves wanted to delay the discovery of the crime. The place is a disaster. My first impression was there was gonna be a lot of time and effort needed to work this out. It was something we couldn't just plow into because we had a crime scene. We were able to walk in, a few of us, and look around and see what the extent was as best we could determine. But we're walking over watches and rings and valuables and everything else because it was all piled into this big uh, cement mess. Special Agent Frank Calley begins sorting through the chaos. Just everything was thrown all over the place. There, uh, the locks of hair, um, all kinds of check statements, uh, photographs, uh, things that people would normally put in the, in the in a safety deposit box. I remember seeing the urns with ashes of deceased people uh, in there. The agents begin the arduous task of determining how the burglars entered the seemingly impenetrable vault. 
They noticed dark soil and pieces of burlap mixed with the cement rubble. Outside, they find the bank's audible alarm disabled. They also find a ladder. Interpreting the clues, investigators piece together the burglar's intricate plan to breach the vault. They disabled the alarm by injecting it with liquid styrofoam. It hardened, freezing the clapper in place and rendering the alarm useless. Then the burglars climbed onto the roof. Investigators find tape on a rooftop outlet, suggesting the burglars used the bank's electricity. When agents cannot find fingerprints on the tape, they conclude the burglars wore gloves. Fully powered, the burglars sawed a four-foot opening into the roof. Once inside the rafters, they clearly knew how to bypass the interior silent alarm system. They took a couple of uh, the wires and that we would have normally transmitted the alarm signal and then they clipped them both and soldered them together. It was delicate, highly skilled work. I knew right away they, 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 they were smart, they did the homework. Even with the alarm disabled, 16 inches of steel-reinforced concrete stood between the burglars and the contents of the vault. The only way through, an intensely powerful blast. Agents believe the bandits drilled holes into the cement, then inserted dynamite and electric blasting caps. The blast had to be precisely directed to blow through the cement without injuring the burglars or attracting attention. Agents conclude that the burlap fragments in the soil in the vault indicate that the burglars came prepared. They placed the, the burlap bags over the explosive, not only to muffle the sound, but also it would direct the, the charge into the, into the vault itself and, and keep the charge going into the concrete where they wanted it rather than coming back out where they were. The investigators discover burn marks on the steel rebar that reinforces the cement. They conclude that the burglars knew the blast could not crack steel and came prepared with an acetylene torch. Agents turn their attention to assessing the total loss. Bank officials report $50,000 is missing from cash drawers. But the thieves were not content with the cash. They took the time to break into 458 safe deposit boxes. Investigators find tool marks on the locks of the boxes and deduce the burglars used a pointed instrument and a lot of brute force to break them open one by one. They carefully sorted through every item, leaving behind what they didn't want. Amazingly, the bandits were so methodical that they got in and out without being seen or heard. In 1972, most banks were closed on weekends. Agents conclude that the suspects took full advantage of that fact. 
apparently they had been in there several times in and out over the weekend. I probably went, went in on a Friday night and they probably didn't get out there late Sunday night. Not only had the burglars pulled off such a lengthy, complex crime, they did it without leaving a single fingerprint. Although investigators do find a brown cotton glove and broken drill bits, neither is unique enough to be traceable. Agents and deputies collect the debris for further examination at the crime lab. But with no apparent evidence and no witnesses, agents are facing the tough challenge of identifying and locating a group of highly skilled criminals, including electronics and explosives experts. Investigators turn their attention to determining the total loss from the safe deposit boxes. It will be extremely difficult since banks do not keep records of their contents. Ordinarily, if you had a bank burglary, you would be missing cash. You'd go out and say, yes, we've got to find $350,000 worth of cash. At this point, we did not know what was gone. It's a very affluent area. And so the possibilities of a tremendous amount of money and material being lost was, uh, was evident. Investigators begin the arduous task of carefully sorting and cataloging every item left in the vault. Then, by interviewing every box holder, agents learn the details of missing jewelry, rare gold coins, and bearer bonds. By a process of elimination, they slowly create a list of the stolen goods. The bank's loss of $50,000 in cash pales by comparison, as the value of the missing items rises to over $8 million. The heist has now become the largest bank burglary in U.S. history. With no physical evidence to go on, investigators hope to develop leads by thinking like the bandits. We felt that uh, they would need oxygen to burn the, the rebar, and so we canvass hospitals, oxygen supply places, and things like that. Despite checking every oxygen supplier in the area, agents come up with nothing. We also felt that a drill of some type had to be used, obviously a large one, so we canvassed places to find if anybody had sold or rented a large drill, as we felt it would have to be used. Again, agents go to dozens of equipment shops, checking records during the time surrounding the break-in. But they find no suspicious purchases or rentals. Clearly, the criminals in this case have masterminded and pulled off a nearly perfect heist. With no witnesses, no direct clues, and certainly no suspects, it seems impossible to solve. But the FBI is determined to identify the burglars and find them wherever they are. In March 1972, a professional crew of burglars blasted their way into a bank vault in Laguna Niguel, California, near Los Angeles. Over a weekend, they emptied hundreds of safe deposit boxes, made off with more than $8 million in cash and valuables, then disappeared without a trace. Agents believe they are an experienced band of criminals. The case is difficult to crack for the small Santa Ana FBI office. Needing more resources, they seek the help of the larger Los Angeles FBI field office. Special Agent Paul Chamberlain supervises the investigation. At the time, it was our conclusion that this was the largest bank burglary in the history of the United States. We went to just about everyone in the office. It was several hundred agents, and, and that's not a typical response, but it became apparent that the crime was a significant crime. The Santa Ana agents quickly briefed the Los Angeles office on the details. <laughs> We'd not had a bank burglary like that in recorded history in, in the Los Angeles division. Uh, burglaries that did occur with banks involved a small effort, and this was a systematic, big-time operation that lasted over three days. 
Since the burglars seem to be highly skilled professionals, yet have not struck Los Angeles before, agents conclude that they're probably from out of town. An agent sends a teletype to all other FBI officers, asking if anyone knows of similar bank burglaries. They get a hit from the Cleveland, Ohio field office, where agents have been investigating similar bank heists, 13 of them, in fact. The description of the California burglary immediately strikes a chord with them, including Special Agent Buddy Nix. We knew from the modus operandi, the MO, the outside alarm had styrofoam uh, spray placed in it to keep the audible alarm from activating the fact that it was a roof job, the fact that the alarm system had been bypassed were all indications that the bank burglar crews in Youngstown very well may have been involved. The Ohio agents believe the 13 Ohio bank heists were committed by the Youngstown Erie Bank Burglary Group, a loose association of criminals tied to organized crime. The California agents were right. These are no small-time crooks. Youngstown at that time was just a mecca for organized crime act activities. I mean, they controlled the illegal gambling businesses, and they they were you know very much involved uh, in uh, interstate transportation of stolen property and and tractor trailer uh, thefts. And there were burglary crews that were operating. And there were a lot of very sophisticated burglaries that were taking place at that time. As part of earlier investigations, the Youngstown, Ohio agents have identified nearly 100 men believed to be part of the burglary group. They've collected intelligence on each of them. Agents send the men's names and mugshots to the Los Angeles FBI. There, investigators try to narrow the list. Since the criminals must have traveled to California, agents check airline passenger manifests from around the time of the burglary. Without the benefit of modern computers, it is a time-consuming process done by hand. After an exhaustive search, they find the names of five men from the Youngstown list who had boarded a recent flight to Los Angeles. That's great. Emil Dinzio, Harry Barber, Charles Mulligan, Charles Brockles, and Philip Christopher arrived in California nine days before the heist. The sixth man, James Dinzio, came in on a different flight the day before the burglary. Charles Finally, Brockles. agents have developed James suspects. Dinzio and his brother, Emil Dinzio. Yes. Agents review the intelligence gathered on the six members of the burglary group. All have long records for home and small business burglaries First suspect we're look and have done today. little jail time. Emil, so we get Emil Dinzio appears to be the brains of the gang, the leader. Yeah, uh, you need to pay attention to that picture. He plans the jobs and handpicks the team to pull them off. Uh, Charles Brockles uh, is an explosives and electronics expert, well versed in bank alarms. Agents believe Philip Christopher is a lookout for the gang. The other gang members are all relatives of the leader and probably help with the grunt work. There's Emil's older brother, James. His face only a mother could love. And Charles Mulligan, Emil's brother-in-law. Here, you're going to really appreciate this guy. Yeah, I got There's also right Emil's here. nephew, Harry Barber. OK. Why don't you take a look at this guy? The men are all seasoned professional criminals, well-connected in organized crime. The Youngstown, Ohio FBI has linked them circumstantially to many bank burglaries, but never had direct evidence. All right. and, uh, he's the charges nobody. never stuck. He's a nobody, not a heavyweight, but we got a... The only information that links the suspects to the crime is that they were all in Los Angeles at the time of the burglary. 
agents begin the difficult job of tracking their movements, starting at the airport. We then canvassed and interviewed every cab driver at LAX that was working that day. That was a massive project. If I had, uh, if I showed you a couple pictures... Agents spend days interviewing dozens of drivers. It finally pays off. One cab driver recalls taking a group of five men to a home in the nearby community of Southgate. He remembers the trip well. The cab driver specifically remembered these folks for, for two reasons. One, because of the $100 tip, but for the other reason, they were tough, mean-looking guys. Agents get the address from taxi records and decide to go there. But it is a risk. Agents fear that if the suspects find out they're investigating the burglary, they might skip town. They have to take the chance. It is their only lead, according to Special Agent Jim Conway. But we had to interview somebody. We had to get our investigation started. And we were concerned that, naturally, that the rest of them would be aware that we were at least that close to identifying them. Agents learn that the Southgate house belongs to the Barber family. Ronald Barber, the brother of suspect Harry Barber, agrees to an interview but is elusive. We did not have a warrant or anything at that particular time. We had nothing positively to tie him to it. But the more he talked, the more he seemed to know, and uh, the more uh, we were impressed that uh, he knows a whole lot. Ronald Barber claims the six men were never at his house. Agents still have no direct evidence. Yet they believe Barber's story may be at least partially true. They note that the house seems too small to accommodate Ronald and six other men staying there. Agents conclude that at least some of them likely stayed elsewhere. So agents spread out, checking one hotel after another, starting with those closest to the bank Special Agent Frank Kelly. We figured these fellows were high rollers. They knew they were going to get a big haul, so they were going to stay at a nice place. So we were knocking on the doors of every fine hotel in the L.A., Orange County area. It is more tedious, time-consuming footwork. Thank you very much. But they do not give up. Sir, I'm with the FBI. On a hunch, one agent decides to take a different approach. There was an agent who... Uh, figured that uh, maybe they didn't stay at the best hotels, and he took it upon himself to walk into a truck stop hotel. And lo and behold, he found out that uh, Emil Denzio had stayed there. You're sure? You should positive. Emil Denzio is the leader of the burglary group. But they would have been together all five. Records show his brother-in-law, Charles Mulligan, also rented a room there around the time of the heist. Agents check Mulligan's registration card and find a license plate number. Stenzio. They trace it to the Southgate address of Ronald Barber. Investigators now have seven suspects, the six from Ohio and the local Ronald Barber. They still have nothing directly linking the men to the crime. But the investigation is finally rolling forward, and the FBI is closing in. Weeks after a well-planned multi-million dollar bank burglary in Southern California, the FBI identifies seven suspects. Ringleader Emil Dinzio and his brother James Dinzio, Charles Mulligan, Philip Christopher, and Charles Brockles, and Harry Barber and his brother Ronald Barber. A notorious gang of professional thieves based in Youngstown, Ohio. Agents determine at least two of the men stayed at an area motel days before the heist. Special Agent Paul Chamberlain is convinced the men are responsible, but he has no evidence to prove it. By reference and innuendo, you, you kind of knew who was involved, but you need to have the evidence in federal court. Agents subpoena the motel phone records and find a series of calls to a local man named Earl Dawson. Our background investigation concluded he was a former um, military, a Marine guy with some training in uh, munitions. 
explosives. Uh, and in as much as we had uh, major explosions that occurred at the bank, it became interesting to us. Special Agent Frank Kelly learns of another interesting connection. Yeah, we're gonna be down uh, Dawson is from Youngstown, Ohio, the base of operations for the burglary group. So there's a, the light goes off again. And, and we say, well, now we got another break. We got the connection somehow between the boys from Youngstown, the Denzios, and, 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 their, and their cohorts in Dawson. The agents decide to approach Dawson at his house to convince him he should cooperate. They show him pictures of Emil Denzio and his associates and ask if he knows them. Dawson is reluctant to talk. I was in the Corps as well. Knowing Dawson is a former Every Marine, Special Agent Callie appeals to his sense of duty. Er was a very patriotic individual, and I'm a former Marine, and we just kind of played that. I said, come on, Earl. You know, you're a former Marine. You've served your country. I said, what's well, important, Earl? It's a big case. And he said, what is it? I said, heard about that bank burglary down in Laguna Niguel? I know you know something. Callie's tactic works. Dawson comes clean. He admits knowing three of the suspects, Emil Dincio, Emil's brother James, and Charles Mulligan. He and Mulligan are old friends who grew up together in Youngstown. Dawson tells Callie that the day before the Laguna Niguel heist, Mulligan came to his house with the other suspects. Mulligan gave him $100 to leave the house for a few hours so they could hold a meeting. Dawson left without hearing what they discussed. But Dawson adds that he does have something the agents might want to see. Mulligan left a car in his garage. It's still there. It is a huge break. Perhaps the car holds the evidence they've been looking for. But before they can check it out, they're interrupted. While I'm talking to him, the phone rings. He answers the phone and he picks it up. And he points to the phone and he mouths the word Mulligan. Thinking quickly, Agent Callie asks Dawson's permission to eavesdrop, a legal requirement for using what he hears in court. Dawson signals that there is another phone in the bedroom. Mulligan comes out and he says, uh, hey, the, has anybody, has the FBI been around? Dawson says, no, they, they're not around. I think I've almost had a laugh myself at the time listening to this. Uh, he, he's playing a beautiful role out there. He's really flip-flop. He's on our side now. Mulligan explains that he knows the FBI has been asking questions about him and his cohorts and that they're getting worried. And he's heading back to the Los Angeles area. Yeah, sure. Mulligan said, uh, I, uh, I'm, I want to come out tonight sure. and uh, to see us. Sure. I'm going to move the, my car, the car in the garage. Agent Callie seizes the opportunity to trap Mulligan. But he fears that he might be setting up Dawson yeah, yeah, that'd be great. and the FBI. I didn't know for sure that this officer seems he could be sitting across the street at the time watching us, for all we know, with our FBI car sitting out front. Callie instructs Dawson to arrange a meeting with Mulligan in a public place. Dawson tells Mulligan to meet him at his favorite bar, the Walnut Room. Mulligan agrees. Now agents have a chance to inspect the car Mulligan left in the garage. But it does not belong to Dawson, so he cannot give them permission to search it. Through the window, they can see a pair of brown cotton gloves, exactly like the one found in the vault. The back seat is covered in what appears to be cement dust, similar to the debris found at the crime scene. It is the probable cause agents need to obtain a search warrant for the car. They also obtain an arrest warrant for Charles Mulligan, and set up surveillance at the Walnut Room. Plainclothes agents position themselves inside the bar, not far from Dawson. 
We staked it out, so to speak. We, four of us were inside waiting, and uh, we had a couple of men outside waiting for him to arrive. Dawson introduces Agent Callie to some regulars as a buddy from the Marine Corps. The agents have to look natural while staying sharp. Earl Dawson's safety is their primary concern. We didn't know what was going to happen, so we had to protect Earl. Agents devise a method for Callie and Dawson to communicate. Either one of them can signal the other by simply going to the restroom where they will meet. Three hours later, Mulligan finally arrives. He appears to be alone and greets his old friend, who tries to get him to talk about the heist. I didn't want to be too close. I was across the bar from him. Earl was talking to him and, and asking him something about you were involved in that, that deal down in Laguna Niguel. And old Mulligan said, well, what do you think? Unable to hear everything they're saying, Callie heads to the restaurant. Dawson follows. In the men's room, Callie asks for an update. Dawson explains that Mulligan is anxious to leave and to pick up the car from Dawson's garage. No problem. Okay. Callie tells him to go, but instructs Dawson not to get into Mulligan's vehicle. Whatever you do, don't get inside that car. Okay, don't get in the car. What don't Callie the doesn't car. tell him is that agents are in the parking lot, poised to capture Mulligan. Agents finally make the first arrest in the case. As they take Mulligan into custody, they pretend to arrest Dawson as well to mask his involvement with authorities. Mulligan is charged with bank burglary. He does not resist arrest. But when agents try to question him, he refuses to talk. They hope to find answers in the car he was trying to pick up. Agents return to Dawson's house and search the car in the garage. Found this large motor used as a drill, and some other tools that we felt were very much uh, probably the ones that were used in the actual committing of the crime. Agents recover stolen coins, along with drill bits, acetylene torches, hammers, and other items that could have been used for the Laguna Niguel heist. Exactly. And we felt very good about it. Felt we hit pay dirt. We hit a home run. Evidence technicians ship everything to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for processing. As examiners take days to analyze the evidence, field agents follow up on more phone records from the motel. One number belongs to a real estate agency in Laguna Niguel, California. A manager shows agents a condo she rented to suspects Ronald and Harry Barber days before the burglary. The barbers told her they planned to stay three months, but left after only three weeks. No damage, no problems. She was able to put the day that they got there and the day they left together for us. The men moved out suddenly on March 27th, the day the crime was discovered. The manager gives investigators permission to search the condo, which is within sight of the targeted bank. Agents begin processing the condo for evidence, but initially find nothing. The entire inside had been wiped clean with some kind of a product. It seems the suspects were as meticulous there as they had been during the burglary. There was no evidence recovered at the bank of any value, and therefore, it was not surprising to see a place that had been wiped down and appears as if they had done everything to, to ensure there was no evidence. They'd done just about everything right. But in fact, they made one crucial mistake. One of the evidence persons went to the um, dishwasher and opened the dishwasher and realized that it was loaded with dirty dishes and that someone had neglected to push the on button. The dirty dishes are covered with multiple latent fingerprints. At the FBI lab, examiners recover the prints from the dishes and from the tools agents found in Mulligan's car 
and match them to five of the seven suspects. Toolmark experts examine the damage on the safe deposit boxes and compare them to the striking point of a snout-nosed hammer from Mulligan's trunk. They report another match. The FBI's case is gaining momentum with good circumstantial evidence and one suspect in custody. Now agents must find the other six and enough evidence to put them away for good. In Southern California, the FBI connects a team of seven members of an organized crime ring based in Youngstown, Ohio, to a multi-million dollar bank burglary when they recover tools used in the heist from the car of suspect Charles Mulligan. Mulligan's arrest puts the investigation into high gear, according to Special Agent Paul Chamberlain. We did realize that with the arrest of Mulligan, eventually, and, and shortly thereafter, they were going to figure out that we had figured who this group was. And, and therefore, we heightened our investigation. We did everything as fast as we possibly could. But since most of the evidence is circumstantial, the case hinges on the testimony of informant Earl Dawson, a man the FBI must protect. Go ahead and leave with him, all right? Okay. But whatever you do, whatever happens. Earl was probably the, the, the key witness uh, because the case was kind of dry all along. It's, it's physical evidence. It's uh, burgers are very dry. Earl was able to put all the principals together. They were charged with conspiracy and burglary, and they could put them all together at his house. Dawson begins receiving threatening phone calls, pressuring him to keep quiet. The caller insists on a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the matter. But the FBI learns the meeting may have a more sinister purpose. We received informant information uh, that a uh, contract was put out on Earl Dawson's life. And we're gonna come out and uh, to attempt to, to kill, uh, uh, kill Dawson. Agents instruct Dawson to arrange a meeting at his favorite bar, the Walnut Room. But don't tell him about the planned hit. Agents want to confront the men to send a message to the Youngstown crime ring that the FBI is on to them. Agents are confident that they can protect Dawson as long as he stays in a public place. I told Earl, don't leave the this bar. Whatever you do, don't go any place with this. You don't ever leave that room. You stay right in that bar. As before, if either Dawson or Callie needs to communicate, they will meet in the restroom. The alleged hitmen arrive. He started buying Earl some pretty heavy drinks. Earl was basically a beer drinker, but they, you could see they were trying to switch him off to, to stronger drinks. When Dawson starts to look concerned, Callie heads to the restroom. Dawson tells the agent he's scared. The hitmen want him to leave with them. I said, Earl, you're not leaving this place with him. You're leaving, you're not leaving. Agent Callie tells Dawson to wait in the restroom. Listen, stay right here, and I'll be right back to get you. Just stay right here. The agents finally approach the men. They say they know what they came to do. Time to, get out. Let's go. to the hitman, the message is clear. Stay away from Dawson. They had no problem leaving. I went to work at LAX, where they were uh, escorted uh, by LA's finest to an aircraft, and they left uh, Southern California. To keep Earl Dawson safe for good, the FBI decides to put him in the witness protection program. Gone. You're not Agents then go after the remaining burglary suspects. Investigators secure warrants to search their last known addresses. At one house, agents get their first direct link to the burglary. 
Inside a woman's purse, they find a new $20 bill. They compare it to the list of serial numbers of sequence bills taken from the bank. It's a match. Special Agent Buddy Nix of the Youngstown FBI office receives information from an informant indicating that these gang members had been known to bury the cash they stole until they could launder it safely. We identified about a 20 or 25 acre field that we had information that some of the loot was buried in. Uh, we dug in that field for days on end and uh, using uh, picks and shovels and probes and uh, uh, and we finally rented a bulldozer. The land is adjacent to property owned by James Dincio. After more than a week of digging, hey. agents hit the jackpot. They unearthed several foot lockers filled with millions of dollars in cash and bonds that they're able to trace back to the Laguna Niguel bank burglary. Agents then get yet another tip. A neighbor of gang leader Emil Dincio calls police. A lot of money in there. He reports finding a cooler buried in his yard. It is filled with nearly $100,000. Right over there, Mr. Dincio. Investigators match their serial numbers to those taken from the bank and recover Emil Dincio's prints from the cooler. With more direct evidence against the gang, agents begin making arrests. They first go to Ronald Barber's Southgate, California home. They are armed with search warrants. The only person they find is Ronald's mother. The brothers have disappeared. No, I don't. I haven't seen them. All six remaining suspects are still at large. Three months after a multi-million dollar bank burglary, the FBI has solid evidence against seven members of an organized crime ring. With only one suspect in custody, Charles Mulligan, they set out to arrest the others. Emil Dincio, James Dincio, Charles Brockles, Philip Christopher, Harry Barber, and Ronald Barber. Agents go to Emil Dincio's home near Youngstown, Ohio, and discover he's made no attempt to run. Because of his attitude and his air of arrogance, Mr. Dincio actually believed he was above the law and, and was the kind of guy that um, could make things happen his way. When agents arrest Dincio, he is carrying $537 in cash stolen from the Laguna Niguel Bank. Come on, we'll call other gang members are also surprisingly easy to find. Within days, authorities arrest Emil's brother, James Dincio, at an Ohio airport. His carry-on luggage is full of more money from the heist. Agents make their fourth arrest, nabbing Phil Christopher. In his apartment, they discover over $32,000 in stolen cash hidden in his closet. The three men arrogantly maintain their innocence and refuse to cooperate. I got a deal right here. Two months later, agents nab alarm expert Charles Brockles and get a break. They decide to confront him with what evidence they have and explain they can put him away for decades. They offer him a deal. In exchange for his full cooperation in outlining the burglary group and their crimes, Prosecutors will drop all charges against Brockles and place him in the witness protection program. He agrees. Authorities have captured five of the seven suspects. Everyone except the Barber brothers. Authorities extradite them to California and indict them on charges of conspiracy, burglary, and larceny of a federally insured bank. While in jail, Emil Dincio brags about the heist to another inmate. 
and asks for his help in beating the charges. If you don't take care of me, Mr. Tinzio confided in him a great many details that were not in his best interest to confide. He got this other inmate to help him buy an alibi for the time of the bank burglary. But Dinzio has chosen the wrong accomplice. The other inmate was someone who had had contact with law enforcement on many occasions in the past, and he realized that what he was being told would be of some importance to someone, and he came to us. Hoping to receive a lenient sentence for his own burglary case, the inmate tells agents of Dincio's confession and the plan to purchase an alibi. And that was Vegas, Vegas. Last word is alibi. The alibi was that Mr. Dincio was going to be in a motel room, a hotel room in Las Vegas, with a prostitute and with physical evidence that would show that he was there. The FBI sets up a sting. Agents give the inmate a contact to offer Dincio. The contact is actually an undercover agent who will provide Dincio's alibi materials. Dincio takes the bait. At the jail's visitation room, he meets the undercover agent who plays the role of a fixer, a criminal expert in solving problems. Mr. Dincio received what he asked for. He got a registration card, which he registered in on. He put his fingerprint on it. He got a listing of shows, and he got the name of a prostitute who he was with, and that became part of his subsequent defense. In October 1972, the trials begin in Los Angeles. Emil Dinzio offers his false alibi, but the FBI's undercover fixer testifies about the sting. The jury convicts Dinzio and the other four defendants. They receive sentences ranging from 15 to 20 years. But it is not over. Two suspects, Harry and Ronald Barber, are still on the run. Within months, the FBI receives a tip that the two brothers are living in an apartment in Rochester, New York. Agents respond. And Ronald Barber answers the door. They arrest him and return him to California, where a jury convicts and sentences him to 15 years. He refuses to say where his brother Harry is. For eight years, Harry remains a fugitive. Then, in 1980, a woman in Brookville, Pennsylvania, contacts the FBI. I knew him as Brent. She tells agents that her friend has been living with a man who told her he committed a famous bank burglary in California. The other day, only because What's her name? and that his real name is Harry Barber. The woman tells the FBI that in an attempt to lead a legitimate life, the fugitive is working maintenance at a local campground. Agents move in and arrest him. Hey, Barber. Hey, Barber. The FBI hands in the air. Drop the wires. Harry Barber is convicted and sentenced to 20 years. Agents can finally close the case on the largest bank burglary in United States history. Authorities believe Emil Dinzio and his gang committed more than a dozen bank burglaries, stealing over $30 million altogether. By putting them away, FBI agents from Ohio to California stopped one of the most sophisticated bank burglary rings of all time.